Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and a gentleman who always leaves a lasting impression on me, although maybe it's not in a good way, it's Dave Vitti. Hello. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help save you money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Dave. How are you, mate? Jason, I'm very good. Thank you very much. Enjoying this nice, sunshiny weather and just contemplating a barbecue later. Oh, that, oh, that's made me think. I, mean, I have got shorts on today. Hey, so have I. I can even show you. Look, 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 look. <laughs> <laughs> Splendid shorts. Thanks very much. I've retired my jeans for the season. You've retired them for the whole of this season? They don't come out now until October. That's it. Shorts all the way. I like it. I like your style. Thanks very much. Now, our guest today is a star of stage and screen and radio and, well, pretty much everything, really. He's one of the country's finest impressionists and has been taking the mickey out of politicians, which gets my vote, celebrities and anyone else who deserves it. For the last 30 years, it is, of course, the brilliant John Colshaw. Hello, hello, hello. How great to speak to you. Hello there, Jason. Hello there, Dave. Dear friend, dear friend. Oh, dear friend. Well, we've known each I put in there 30 years and, and we've known each other for not far shy of that. We have. We first knew each other in the last millennium. I know. When the year started with a one and a nine. Doesn't Absolutely. that sound it's just... It sounds crazy, eh? <laughs> it does. So, John, you, have you just um, you just been doing a play in Scotland? Is that right? Is that, is that all over now? Yes, yes, we did. Uh, we did a run of a play in in Scotland um, called Lena, all about the life and uh, career of uh, Lena Zavaroni and her story. Uh, quite a bittersweet tale, but it it celebrated her talent and also her bravery. Written by the the wonderful writer um, BAFTA and um, and uh, Olivier winning writer Tim Whitnell, who's, who right. writes fantastic biopics, and he's so wonderful at, um, at uh, th- th- those stories which involve real people, real characters. So yeah, we did a week's run uh, of that in uh, Glasgow, and I was playing Huey Green, which is why I'm by your the moment, friends, very tremendously. Uh, I'm like a walking lighthouse, friends, and thank you for having me. I hope I'm not uh, taking the microphone out of focus. <laughs> I've, I've just checked the hair. That's a Huey Green little yeah. dude you've got going on there, is it? It is. It is. I couldn't be bothered with spray or wigs, <laughs> so I, I just had it coloured, uh, which looked a bit odd. That they, they rubbed the beach, which is sort of like radioactive hummus <laughs> that they put paint on <laughs> with a weird brush, and it absolutely the stink of sulphur. Yeah. It's something else. And then they put this purple dye on to offset the yellow. And I was sat there looking like Mrs. Slocum for half an hour. So we all know you from the impressions. Tell me, where, where did that begin? Was it something you just grabbed at school and when you were a kid and thought, oh, do you know what, I can... How, how, how did that all kick off? I think it was. I grew up in um, Ormskirk in Lancashire. Um, and the characters who were all around, there were some wonderful characters yeah. Um, you know, Mr. Naylor, the coal man. And come along, you were always covered in coal dust. He was sort of like, <laughs> he could have been played by Peter Kerr these days. <laughs> and he, he, he dressed in this sort of like leather clad Roman armour as protection for holding the, um, the, the coal. Yeah, and yeah. He was always covered in soot. And he was just a, it, these eyes and teeth would shine through the the, the, the coal powder that uh, that built up on his face. So what happens, John? Then I suppose when you're when you're doing impressions of people in your everyday life, and obviously a lot of that must involve characters from school. What's the point at which you realise that you've actually got a talent for this? Is it when obviously people start to laugh, you know? And, and is that your in a way, your first audience, where you kind of think, oh, do you know what? I'm quite good at this. I'll do it again. I'll do it again. I'll do it again and master it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it does happen exactly like that. That The more people respond and the more they laugh, mm. and the more they sort of recognise what you're doing, it, it does egg you on. Yeah. Because it, it, it just it makes for a nice atmosphere. If, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you're, you're sort of taking people off and, and so on, and people, people laugh at it. And then the next thing, you know, I'd, I'd notice the characters on TV, the likes of Patrick Moore, <laughs> then watching the Mike Yarwood show. Yeah. Um, and th- then you start noticing people on TV um, and copying their voices too. Mm-hmm. I always love the scientific experts. Patrick Moore, very, very eccentric. David Attenborough, the same. In those days, he spoke in that sort of way. Now, of course, he's like an elder statesman Jedi. Yeah. And should probably be the entire president 
of not only the world, but I would also say the solar system. <laughs> John, one of my favourite moments, actually, in memories of being in a studio with you does involve the boxing impressions. And obviously, Frank Bruno was always one of my favourite ones. We got a lot of stick for this, Jason, believe oh, it or not, because oh, I think, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm right in thinking... The setup was that Lennox Lewis was the night before a big fight in Vegas or something like that. And so the idea of the prank was that we were going to get Frank Bruno to ring him up just to ask him mundane questions in the middle right. of the night, you know, like, yeah. I don't know, how long should I do a shepherd's pie for or you know, <laughs> whatever, just these Brilliant. really mundane things. So anyway, so we wrote this script and we did it all and we recorded it all and, you know, ring, ring and Lennox picks up and obviously Frank has a go. And the reaction from the audience obviously was very funny, but a lot of people kind of going, do you know what, lads, enough's enough. You know, you're sort of taking the mick now because you're literally waking him up at three and four in the morning. And what they really? didn't realize is the fact that they knew that John was doing the Frank Bruno being the, the pest, if you like. Yeah. They didn't realize that he was also Lennox Lewis. Fantastic. So this was a sort of two-part setup. So we'd, we'd recorded all of the Lennox parts first, and then we'd recorded Frank talking to Lennox and vice versa and assembled it all into this sketch. Yeah, I can imagine his diehard fans went, went, went a bit up the wall, eh? Well, this is this is testament to how good John is, is yeah. the fact that they kind of thought, okay, right, we get it. We know that John's doing the Frank Bruno. We've heard that before. Yeah. But they had no idea that his Lennox Lewis was so good that they completely Excellent. felt that that was the real one. Excellent. Yes, exactly. And, and it, I, th I think... It, uh, the BBC Sport website ran it as a news story. <laughs> no, is that right? They did. Lennox gets rude awakening. Was the headline <laughs> from Radio Prankster? How <laughs> brilliant! But as, as you say, Dave, we've we done either side of it. I've I, I done the Frank bits in the studio, and then on my old Nokia mobile, oh, was that it? Building with yes. car, with, with you know, with, to give a different ambience. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, hey, oh boy, hey, come on, oh come on, Frank. This is the third time you've fought me. I gotta fight in the morning, man. <laughs> oh, you're three, you're three, yeah, keep us. <laughs> I keep forgetting. Anyway, give him hell. Yeah, okay, thanks, Frank. Thanks, Frank. That is a great stitch up. I love it. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> John, before we before we cross over to what we we really should be talking about in terms of what the fueling around audience want. I read something recently that you did a sketch at Millbrook, which obviously is somewhere that Jason has been to many, oh, many yeah. times. Didn't you do a Clarkson sketch at Millbrook as Clarkson? Yes, we did. We did. We did. Um, we, we, it was the Clarkson family that was the sketch. And there we were in a, I don't know, I think it was just a Mondeo. <laughs> <laughs> I was Jeremy. Deborah Stevenson was playing Mrs. Clarkson. And there were two uh, two kids who'd come from uh, an acting school who were playing the Clarks and children. And we spent the whole day <laughs> talking in this manner. <laughs> I, I was tempted to spend the rest of my life talking in this way. Uh, James May and the Hamster might wish Paddy McGuinness and what's-his-name well on Top Gear. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That is a great impersonation. Oh, it's really good. It's really good. So, John, listen, we need to talk cars. Where did it all start for you? I know that that was the first question in terms of your impressions, but in terms of your love of the motor vehicle, what are your earliest memories? Oh, I think I, I can remember when my mum bought her first car, the one that she used to run me to school and to the dentists in and shopping, a 1972 Mini 1000. Right. Wow. Um, and we still have it. Do you? Wow. Really? We, we still we still have it. Uh, I think I owe it all to my brother, Jim, really, who is a great car enthusiast. He always loved the uh, American cars. He owned yeah. many American cars. Um, a 1969 Dodge Monaco, wow. which was like the Isle of Wight on wheels. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they are, are they, I mean, they're just ridiculously <laughs> big, aren't they? I mean, they're just hideous things. But great, it's actually. If you fitted some wheels to Guernsey. And drove <laughs> well, off. Yeah. I mean, the reason it's called the Dodge Monaco, it's probably got roughly the same surface area <laughs> yeah, as the yeah. Principality. Yeah. Yes, you could have landed a helicopter on it. Um, he, he had a Dodge Coronet, a Dodge Malibu Classic, uh, three-litre um, 1970 Capri. Ah, right, great. Fantastic. Um, a, a, a Ford Zodiac. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. Mark IV uh, Zodiac. Um, he always had great, great cars, my brother. And then he got into his favourite ones as, as an avid viewer of the Rockford Files. 
he always wanted a firebird esprit. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and in about 1991, he he found one uh, in this lovely sort of holly metallic green color. And uh, for his 60th birthday, um, I had it sent down to Colchester to be resprayed in uh, copper mist. Oh, so wow. it now looks like... Uh, yeah, but it's in mint. It's beautiful. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 yes, and he's still got that as well. And do you like the Yank Tanks? Do, you, do, you, do they tickle your fancy? Yes, I, I, I think I remember in, in the 70s, they were, you know, you'd, you'd see the cars on the road and there'd be, you know, the, the, the aforementioned Mini, the Austin 1100, the Morris Marina, the Austin mm. Maxi, and then mm. a Dodge Malibu classic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> on, on British roads, they just made this fantastic statement. Yeah. yeah. And occasionally, where, where I used to live on the A59, the, the, the road between Preston and Liverpool, uh, occasionally um, a Lincoln Continental, a huge silver Lincoln Continental would just mm. go up the road. And it just looked so dramatic. Yeah. And the sound of them. Yeah. The sound of my brother's Firebird, when he turned it over, he goes... <laughs> <laughs> There's a depth. Of, and he, he was fixing the wheels uh, not so long ago. He had to take the wheels off. Seeing the wheels away from the car, it looks like they belong on an aeroplane. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huge, huge things. And then you compare them to, say, the, the wheels on that 1972 Mini that you were describing, you know, which would have looked like buttons in comparison. Yeah. <laughs> I think they went into orbit around it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they had, there was a gravitational influence. <laughs> Little 10 inches, aren't they, on a Mini, I think. They're 10-inch wheels, aren't they? Which yeah, is tiny, tiny. Yeah. So, hey, you're, you're big into your Fords, aren't you? Tell, tell us about the, the little Ford collection you've got going. Oh, yes, I do, I do love those. I, I think it harks back to that just love of the 1970s, uh, sparked by watching Life on Mars mm -hmm. uh, with that wonderful um, GXL Cortina. And um, I, I started to think it would be really interesting to try and find a 1970s Ford. And eventually I found a place in Essex called Affordable Classics, yeah. which had a few. So uh, I, I got uh, I got a, a Mark I Ford Granada first, or a console, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I tracked down the place that um, that did all of the um, restorations on Pimp My Ride UK, yeah. <laughs> which is over in Colchester. <laughs> and a wonderful chap called Ronnie, um, who uh, resprayed re them and just retrimmed them. And um, yeah, so I started to, uh, I had a 1974 console. A 1972 Mark III Cortina, mm -hmm. um, and I'd, I'd I'd swap and change them a little bit. Um, All through I'd, this same place, John. Is this ultimately yes. sort of through the same garage? Yes, it was. It, it was. Um, I had I had a Mark I um, Granada gear Ooh. from 1974 as well, which had once been owned by a Practical Classics magazine. Oh, really? Yeah. They, it, they, I think they'd driven from, um, I think it was a, a vicar once owned it, and he sold it to Practical <laughs> Classics. And they then drove it to Poland, I think, filled up the boot with pork pies and drove it back. <laughs> and uh, they did a feature on it a few, a few years ago. Yeah. Um, I had no idea that this had been part of its existence. Well, that was a lovely gold uh, Mark One Granada with, you know, velour seats. Yeah. That mm. lovely warm. It's a thing, isn't it, a velour seat, where you get in an old car and it's got, it's got those, those seats. It's actually very nice, isn't it, in a kind of old-fashioned way? Oh, yeah, it, it just gives yeah. you a hug. You sit yeah. down, it gives yeah. you a hug. Yeah. In the winter, it's warm. In the summer, it, it doesn't sort of like uh, <laughs> sort yeah. of burn you the way that yeah, leather yeah, or plastic yeah. does in the sunshine. And what, what have you got now? Uh, I've got two of them at the moment, uh, a Mark I uh, Ford Granada, yeah. um, a 74, a silver one, which was actually used in um, the TV show uh, on Channel 4, The Curse, oh, uh, yeah. about the, you know, the Brinks mat and all of yeah. that stuff. Mm. Um, the, the car that uh, Hugo Chegwin's character uh, drove around in was, was my silver Granada. Uh, so I've got that one, and I've got another one in Colchester, um, a Mark I Granada Coupe oh, yeah. in Miami Blue, which is yeah. with Ronnie at the moment, and right. <laughs> that's, being, uh, that's being restored at the moment. And do you have an agent then for your cars? <laughs> no, joking aside, I would imagine that actually when you own something like that, 
there is such a demand for period cars for different looks and for different shows that if you've got a Cortina or Granada or whatever it might be, that there must be work for them. Yes, exactly. It was This was a lucky little thing, really. The, the producer of the show, The Curse, uh, uh, a friend of mine, Richard Webb, great producer, um, he, he produced mine and Deborah's impression show back in the day. So he knew I had some of these. And so uh, he said, OK, we're doing this show set in 1983. <laughs> You've still got that Granada. <laughs> oh, could, could we could we use it? So yeah, of course, of course. So it was uh, just through word of mouth like that. Yeah. Hey John, have you ever done a um, a body roll over a capri bonnet in the kind of what? like a professional style? Have you ever have you ever done that? I don't think that I have. No, I sure hope I don't get to do it. But <laughs> our Mister Vitti has done that. Wow. Jason and I did, we did a couple of things for Fifth Gear, didn't we, over the years? But one of them is that they asked me what my kind of, you know, what my era was, what my cars were. And actually, John, you can testify for this, because actually at the time when we first met in the mid to late 90s, I was driving a Mark V Ford Cortina. No word of a lie. That was my daily runaround, right? And then, because it started to go wrong, I then sold it to my mate Andy the Greek for 200 quid, and then he sort of took it for the latter stages of its life. Palliative care, if you like, in the most. <laughs> yes. And then I, I traded it in for a white Capri. Do you remember? I had that I, white Capri laser. I love that car. So did I. I loved it I as well. I love that car. And so anyway, <laughs> when the producers of Fifth Gear said, oh, what was your era? And I said, well, for me, it was all about old Fords as well. You know, they, those were the cars that I associated with my dad. And my dad loved old Fords because he could fix them. My dad yeah. was an engineer. He wasn't a mechanic. He, you know, he wasn't a specialist in anything, but he was of an engineering background and he knew that he could fix them. And that's why he liked old Fords. And so this was the this was the era that they were going for so they decided to devise a kind of sweeney stroke professionals kind of little setup and have jason teach me how to do power slides in a capri and then also how to do the roll over the bonnet and we were <laughs> which, which which i've never done <laughs> and i don't know why i was the instructor for that <laughs> and you know what and when you look at the sketch that becomes evident very quickly yeah. <laughs> Because the thing is, when you try and roll over a bonnet, it's nothing like it is on the films. You know, it's not a smooth process like you see where they do roll and and they slide. When you hit a bonnet at speed, (laughs) you just sort of lump over it and then Mm. fall off the other side. Um, it's not a, it's not an attractive look. I find it's a it's an incredible skill. I think that those professionals Mm. had to do that on on a on a weekly basis. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll tell you what else was tricky, Jason, that day at that airfield up in Bruntingthorpe, I think it was, up in Leicestershire, yeah. is the fact that you were teaching me with all of your knowledge of how to power slide, but trying to do that in a 1600 <laughs> yeah, Capri, yeah. right, was difficult because there wasn't an awful lot of guts under there, was there? No, he was gruntless, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> that was a fun day, though. I love I love the fact that you know hearing about how you've done your own stunts here. <laughs> and it's, it's nice talking to you after the fact because I, I know <laughs> you, you must be all right because here you are. You know, here we are. <laughs> We've always done our own stunt. Jason, Jason, you you spend a lifetime doing your own stunts. <laughs> Professional stuntman. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yes. I, and still, still. I mean, I, I I should find out today actually if something interesting is going to crack on. But still, fifty four years old, still driving around in circles. I'll eventually get somewhere. <laughs> it is amazing to watch we we had a, a stunt driver and a chap called andy smart um who um we, we did quite a lot of uh, sketches as gene hunt with the yeah. red audi quattro yeah, yeah. yeah and watching andy smart driving that at huge speed mm. uh, and doing all of the handbrake turns and all of the donuts and whatnot it was just incredible yeah. and then i'd step out the car and everyone thought i'd done it <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like just the way they make top gear absolutely oh there's a dig oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh. moving swiftly on john what's yeah. the motoring itch that you haven't scratched as yet you were talking before obviously about the granadas and the cortinas is there something there that you've never managed to get your hands on that you still would like to oh yeah i, I would love i think a, a mark one capri Mm. That would be uh, a, a fabulous thing. I've got uh, great memories of my, my brother's one, uh, XBB one nine four H, with the vegetation, 
Um, it's a lost skill, isn't it? Remembering number plates and phone numbers. <laughs> we, um, we, you know, we talk about this a lot, though. And, and the yeah. kid, you know, we, we, we're we all the same. I can remember every number plate from every car in my life from the age of about three, right? So not only all of mine that I've owned, which isn't a huge amount, but probably amounts to maybe a dozen vehicles in, in my motoring lifetime, but every one of my dad's from when I was a kid. That's, I mean, that's weird. I think they are such an identity, aren't they? They yeah. are an identity. And especially when they spell words or the numbers are familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, absolutely. All, all those, those three words you then make into another word, you know, or whatever it was, you know. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's all part of their identity. But yes, I'd, I'd love a Capri. I'd, I do love the, um, the 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 Ford Zodiac, the boxy one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. before the Granada came in. Yeah, yeah. I remember the Brigadier from Doctor Who would uh, drive around in one of those. Yes, Doctor, yes. Uh, report to unit headquarters immediately. Uh, yes, lay on my car, would you? Thank you, Benton. Um, yeah, a Zodiac. <laughs> in the days before power steering, when uh, yeah. any regular driver of even a Morris Minor would end mm. up with arms like Popeye. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? It's too, and it took so many years from the birth of cars to, to, for them to work this out. Actually, we, I think we need power steering. Yeah. Mm. It really came but, on uh, only on online about the 80s, I would think. That's when it started yeah, to yes. appear, wasn't it? You know, those Rover 3500s and yeah. um, that sort of period. Yeah. Mm. And you'd, you'd find your neighbours boasting about, oh, electric windows and power steering. <laughs> you remember the wider windows? <laughs> God, you yeah. forget that, don't you? In fact, that, that was what all the car commercials boasted about. Yeah. yeah. In those days, from cruise control to power steering mm. and electric windows. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the electric aerial? Oh, <laughs> What was that about? Yeah. But, but it was to was make a, us all think we were Roger Moore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also remember, do you remember when they used to have electric windows, but only on the front? Oh, they yes. would have electric windows on the front. And this is obviously when they were, I suppose, when they were trying to introduce them to pretty regular box standard cars and put them into Escorts and put them into Orions and whatnot. But I always recall they had electric at the front. And then obviously it's only really the kids who sat in the back so they could wind their own <laughs> bloody windows. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Hey, exactly. talking about electric, do, does that rock your boat the way the mo motor is going now? Electric cars, you, you, have you tried any? Do you have one? Do, do you know, I, I don't. I, I, I don't. Uh, for, for the amount of driving I do, I'll usually just pootle around in the Granada. Mm. Um, but, yes, it, it's a fascinating thing. I, if, if I see an electric taxi, I'll always do, go for one of those. Oh, yeah. Mm. The silence of them, the smoothness. And it does sort of feel like... Um, a feature from Blue Peter circa 1978. Of course, by the early part of the 21st century, it's very unlikely we'll be using petrol or diesel at all. If we think of a big car battery, this could be the way that we're motoring. And now it's all come true. Yeah. But John, knowing how retrospective your motoring tastes and loves are, by the time we are all in electric cars, you'll be in a Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> You basically just take wherever we are now and then take 40 years off. Yeah, yeah. just put a, put a big battery in the boot to adapt it <laughs> um, and, and find it that way around. Yeah, I, I, do, I do love the uh, electric cars. There's something very elegant and futuristic about them. Mm. There's a lovely sense of science fiction yeah. about them. Yeah, there is. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a marvellous thing. It really is a marvellous thing. And I wonder what the the you know flying cars will will be like. Surely that'll come. The, they'll be adapted into being big drones, uh, but before <laughs> some time. I, I think that will happen actually. Yeah, really actually, do. as ridiculous as it sounds, it does make sense, isn't it? In so much as the the what's that noise? I think that was um, oh. um, uh, MG a Maestro. Drone? Circa, <laughs> I think it was a, a Morris Atal, I think. <laughs> Morris Atal, oh, yes. Now, what a, a, what a great actor he was. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, do you know what? It's a good stage name, isn't it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Morris, Morris. Atal. <laughs>
You can, you, you can just see him headlining and butlins in mine head on <laughs> on Sunday night, not Friday or Saturday. <laughs> Sunday night. <laughs> so I'd want to do Saturday. I'd love to do Saturday, obviously, but Austin Allegro, the magician, does that night. <laughs> oh, that uh, was a beauty. What what wasn't it? The Allegro. Oh, oh. Dear, what a, a cowpat on wheels yeah. that was. Yeah. I mean, bless it and everything, but oh, yeah. dear, oh, dear. And the princess, there's another beauty. Yeah, very sort of like a door wedge, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oddly yeah. triangular. Yeah, yeah. Right. Dreadful, dreadful thing. But mind you, in saying that, do you remember when Cortina ended and then this spaceship weird Sierra came out? Nobody liked it at the time. I can remember seeing all the press shots going, God, that's awful. Yeah. But to look back at it now, amazing, isn't it? That that because that was a big step for Ford, I think, at that at that point. point Huge, time. actually, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. Huge. Yeah. It really. And they were they were good cars once once everybody had got used to it. Yeah. And maybe when they'd done the first little Basically, revision on the look of it, mm. they just made the lights a bit broader. Yeah, yeah. And just slightly altered, just slightly finessed the design, and wow beautiful really collectible it was a really really brave launch though wasn't it or a brave mm. move by mm. ford because when you think about the evolution of car models and whatnot ordinarily they never change that much do they you know they always talk about facelifts and they just do little tweaks and i know when new models come in but ultimately they're still not that different but that was i think probably the most radical shift from one to another in motoring that i've ever known yeah, yeah exactly that. it was it was such an 80s statement wasn't it mm. to deliberately try and grab the future or some futuristic sense can you imagine the first me meeting when the head of design is coming to the board and gone guys can i just show you what we'll be working on <laughs> can you imagine what, like, <laughs> what the hell is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, what, what have you really designed then you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the yeah. thing was and i read read something about this recently actually is that um because I might be a member of the Cortina Facebook club. But anyway, keep that to yourself. Um, but I read something recently whereby the the early sales of the Sierra was hampered by Ford's own dealers with all their backlog of old Crusaders and stuff that they were trying to shift at discount. Is that so right? Honestly, yeah, the Sierra was – the, the biggest competition to the Sierra was the outgoing Cortinas that yeah. they were trying to shift off the off the fork. Yes, they, they were just waiting for their moment for it to actually – bite and yeah. for the yeah. market to be available to absolutely. it absolutely um john i'm going to ask you for your two car fantasy garage this is something we ask most people and well, we always get the same sort of thing with you i think it might be a very different answer because i don't think that you're going to go for a bugatti veyron and a whatever what, what's the two car fantasy garage with money no object if you could have anything in the world what do you think it would be oh my goodness that's a splendid question that is a splendid question. I think I would like um, Doctor Who's Hoomobile. You know, the Kirby wow. Swifty one. Right. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. looked like a, a, a three-wheeler hovercraft. Yeah. <laughs> um, Brilliant. The, the Hoomobile. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love that one. And that would obviously be your daily runner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, it would be. Because it does yeah. have the power of flight and time Absolutely. travel. Yes. So I could go back and have a look at the Cortinas. And maybe this is such what what a question what a question. Um, I know as soon as I've said it, I'm, uh, later in the day I'll change my mind and wish I'd picked something else. I wonder. I wonder. Do you know, I, I do love that the 1970s Rolls Royce. Mm. There's just something about those. That there's just such a, a warmth and a cuddliness yeah. about them. Uh, you know, the ones that Eric Morecambe and Larry Grace yeah, and yeah, such yeah, people yeah, used yeah. to own. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I think of when I think of a Rolls Royce as well. And, yeah. and again, I think that's to do with our, our respective ages. But when I think of a Rolls Royce, that's immediately the picture that I get is that sort of. And they were really floaty and lollopy, weren't they? You know, you could see them when they drove down the road. You could see the suspension <laughs> yeah. like a bit like a big yeah. blancmange. Yeah. Yes, lollopy. They were lollopy. They were lollopy, yeah. weren't they? Lollopy is a very good frame of mind. It's yes, I'm 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 quite a lollopy soul, I think. So <laughs> yeah. I'll have one of those. I'll have one of those. But then on another day, you know, a, a, a Capri and a Sierra and 
it could go on and on and on. Mm. Now, music and cars go well, John. So if you were going to have, say, uh, like a fantasy drive, where would you be going? What would you be listening to? And more importantly, what would you be driving? Oh, my goodness. Wow. Um, I think I would take a Mark One Capri. Mm-hmm. And I think I might drive all the way to Switzerland. Wow, nice. I think across, you know, just through some mountains. And mm. Yeah, yeah. The kind of road and the kind of scenery were in Pierce Brosnan's first uh, scenes as James Bond. Mm. And he's driving around the mountains through there. So, something like that. And who would be on the cassette deck? <laughs> uh, I don't or, know. Or would it be an eight track? Would it be an eight track? <laughs> yes, maybe maybe an eight track. Yeah. Too many great, great things to think of. See, I almost I <laughs> now, now with that image, I sort of see that accompanied by a, a film score. I'm kind of thinking about, you know, those big orchestral sort of James <laughs> Bondy incidental music as you as you waft. Yeah, through yeah. the Alps. Exactly. I think it's. I think it's actually uh, Louis Armstrong. We have all the time in the world. Yeah, oh, there we oh, go. That's oh. it. That's it. That's perfect. absolutely it, isn't it? <laughs> absolutely and, perfect. And waft is a great motoring term, isn't it? Yes, waft. <laughs> waft and lollop. <laughs> I do. I like to waft and lollop. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm not terribly ambitious. Wafting and lolloping will be fine. <laughs> Oh dear, on that note Jason I think you need to take us out Well sadly that's about it for this week's Fueling Around Powered by Adrian Flux As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs And help save you money on your car, your bike Or even your home insurance Dave, as always, thank you But a huge thanks to our very special guest this week The one and only Mr John Colshaw Thank you very much indeed And next week we'll have that wonderful double act uh, Waft and Lollop and the great Morris of Town. We'll see you then. <laughs> Don't forget, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plato or at David Vitti. And if you like what you've heard, feel free to give us a five-star rating, press the subscribe button and share the podcast on all your socials. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Ta-da! Ta-da!